Hello and welcome to episode 100. This is a very special edition of the Town Hall Academy, as you'll hear from nine of your industry peers who will discuss a leadership trait that will build a ladder of change and improvement to your leadership capabilities. Now, here's a taste. Because your spouse knows that Thursday night is supposed to be date night. They also know how many times you've bailed on it because you had some, you know, you had to stay at the shop late to catch up on paperwork. Uh, your kids hear you say that you're going to be at their game, but they don't really expect you to be at their game because you've had things come up so many times before. And in your mind, it's all justified because you're the provider, and and you are, but you've also been a liar. Welcome, automotive aftermarketers, to a Remarkable Results Radio Town Hall Academy. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Hey, Carm Capriato here, and welcome to episode 100 of the Town Hall Academy, an important milestone for the aftermarket in the 100th week of the Academy series. My guests and I built this episode just for you. In the foundation of paying it forward so all ships rise, we thought about making this academy an assertion to all aftermarket professionals to up your leadership strengths and improve you, your business, and therefore the aftermarket. Surely selfless goals, but I think we nailed it. Now, it only works if you listen and do. Don't just say yes, learned a lot, good ideas. You gotta implement. Plan on making change and finding yourself a new leadership level. This is an episode you'll want to listen to more than once. You'll want to read the key talking points from the show notes page because you'll have a blueprint for your personal improvement as a leader. Think of this podcast like nine five-minute TED Talks. I promise, and I've never led you wrong yet. This is a very powerful personal education moment. I want to thank Jasper Engines and Transmissions for their support. You know, a new vehicle may look and smell nice, but they come with seemingly endless monthly payments, higher license fees, and higher insurance premiums. There's a better solution for your customer. Remanufactured components from Jasper means a new lease on life for your customer's trusted old friend. And also thanks to RepairPal. Are you a certified RepairPal shop? Well, did you know that 85% of consumers check prices online? Startling fact. These tech-savvy users are better educated about car repair because of this research. Make sure they find your shop when they're doing their research. Find out how. RepairPale.com slash shops. Hey, as we start our next 100 episodes of the Town Hall Academy, I want to thank you for being there as a listener. Did you know that the context of the aftermarket is spoken here? Pure, honest, riveting, smart, benevolent, educational, comparative, profound. Your own personal education happens with these webinars. As Andy Bizzab said, it's like your own personal 20 group. My guests each chose their own topic and were given five minutes to present a succinct narrative for you. As Brent Bowman said at the end, his head hurt. He was not only a panelist, but he was more of a student. Here are the topics covered. Listening, resilience, learn to be a CEO, perseverance, invest in your staff, delegate and get out of the way, be your word, have high expectations of your team, and train within. You can find the key talking points at remarkableresults.biz slash A100. My panel, Vic Tarasic, Major Accounts Director with RLO Training and a former shop owner of 30 years, Marianne Croce of Croce Transmissions in Norwalk, Connecticut, and business coach at smallbizvantage.com. Bob Greenwood, AMAM, is President and CEO of Automotive Aftermarket E-Learning Center. Greg Buckley, CEO, Buckley's Personalized Auto Care, Wilmington, Delaware. Shari Pheasant, shop owner and the queen of horsepower. Chris Clodier, owner of Golden Rule Auto Care and CEO of Auto Text Me. Brian Walker, founder and CEO of Five Stones Media and former shop owner. Bill Hill, owner of Mighty Auto Pro from Medina, Ohio and Brent Bowman of Highway 7 Service Center in Newell, Iowa. And as you've come to expect with the Town Hall Academy, you'll learn more than you ever expected. So thank you all for being here. Up your game, everyone. Become a level five leader. Vic, we're going to start with you. He's got a great topic to talk about. And you've got five minutes, man, to make an impact And we're all going to sit and listen to you because his topic is listening. Is listening. Thank you, Carm. Well, here's what I found out as a leader. Listening is a two-way street. 
So shop owners, industry professionals, and leaders, what we want, we want our team to listen to us. And an effective leader is got people that do listen to them and they really want to be led by them. But the question I've got for all aspiring leaders like us developing, have we earned the right to be heard? And if we want, you know, my, you know, my, my approach is this, if we want to be, listen, you know, people to listen to us, we got to take the time to listen to them first. You know, a, a leaders, I found this through my, my, uh, you know, grow, growth as a leader through the, as a shop owner is it's not some guy barking orders. You know, a, a, to me, a leader was the guy that had the loudest voice and he was the strongest personality. It's really not the case. It's the person who influences the most. And, and so, you know, with the, with these guys that are, are doing, doing this and who haven't developed as a leader, they expect people to listen because of their position. But what I found is an effective leader, there are people who have taken the time to do a few key things. And, you know, of course we've all heard it. People, you know, they don't care how much you know, till you know how much you care. And Teddy Roosevelt quoted that. John Maxwell quotes that through all his stuff. And so what I found is, is a leader, he's already set the, he's got people listening to him. He's already set the tone. They've earned, earned the right to be heard by doing a few th- few key things. They show they care. And they take a really keen interest in the people that they lead. They're not, they're not just focusing on the role. They're focusing on the person that works with them. They've also demonstrated they can be trusted. They do what they say, and, and they say what they do. They, they, are, they are people of integrity. But the most important thing is they listen first, then they speak. So a highly, highly level leader, he really listens more than he talks. And, you know, it's, I, I put it this way, it's a lot like a, t- a, a diagnostician. What does he do? He gathers information. He's looking to nail down this, you know, the diagnostic issue. He's looking for the solution. So he's, he's taking the time to, to, you know, to, to go after, you know, one symptom or another and to gather what information he needs to solve the problem. A, a leader, what he does is he takes the time, asks questions, he listens, and he, he treat what he, what he really does. He demonstrates Stephen Covey's habit five. He seeks first to understand. Then he seeks to be understood. I'll finalize this with everyone who's listening is, have you earned the right to be heard with the people you lead? Thanks, Vic. That's pretty powerful. Raise your hands if you if you think you're a good leader here on the group. And, you know, I, I, I never earned the right to raise my hand because I, I was a poor, poor leader until I had to learn how to become a, a good leader and uh, a good listener. And and again, I think the reason we started out with listening is the number one quality we uh, that I think will help you on becoming a, a level five leader is is listenership. A really cool side story: when you're an interviewer like I am, and you get to see waveforms on a computer, you can actually look to see that you're only talking ten percent of the time, which was the goal of everything that I do. I want to be able to see the waveform, and so if you can only in your mind think about that. If you had to replay your conversation with someone, how long and how wide would your waveform be versus the person you're listening to? So there's there's a cool little trick. Hey, thank you so much for that, Vic. Great start. Marianne Croce is going to talk about resilience. Hello, and congratulations on the 100th episode. It's very exciting to be here. So becoming a top leader is something that many people focus on, and I want everyone to realize that this is what people struggle with in big businesses as well. It's uh, leadership is the huge topic for many. So when you have leadership as a foundation in your business and you become a strong leader, it really sets the tone, the vision. It sets the direction. That's what a leader does. You empower productivity. And I want to put a real big emphasis on leaders are not born. They're made. It's, it's constantly growing. We have to develop that in us. So whether you're in business just starting out or you've been in business for 30 plus years, what I tell people is it's so important to focus on resilience because 
resilience is really having an I'm curious mindset and a determination to grow and develop no matter what obstacles or challenges come along your way. And as small business owners, we know that there are challenges and obstacles all the time. There are many things that are out of our control. But what we want to do is not focus on those challenges, those obstacles. We want to take what we can learn from them. The more that I developed my leadership skills and my skill sets in general, I became really better at growing my business, developing my team, and bettering the industry. So I really believe strongly that the day that you become an owner, that you have a responsibility, a responsibility to develop yourself as a leader. So what resilience does for us is it really helps us to become the best version of ourselves. And what that does when we're working on that is it builds confidence. And there are a number of ways that it does this. When we're developing ourself and we're using resilience, we build and maintain healthy relationships. Healthy relationships with our team, our customers, our accounts, our vendors, suppliers. And a healthy relationship is a win-win relationship. No one feels taken advantage of. It's definitely a win-win. We learn from the past without dwelling on it. So we become very self-aware. I always tell people, either people that I meet or through uh, coaching, ask the five closest people, and I mean closest people to you. They don't have to be in the industry. Ask them, if you were to tell me, what do you think my biggest challenge is? And ask people that will be brutally honest. You'll find a common denominator there. And it's something that you need to work on. Don't forget to celebrate the wins because a lot of times we start comparing ourselves to everyone else, other shop owners, other business owners, and you may be in a different place right now. So instead of focusing on that, focus on where you've come from, celebrate those wins and your accomplishments. Be proactive instead of reactive. And that means planning and thinking long-term being prepared for the future, whether that's training or having answers to questions or challenging people when they come up, right? Objections, be prepared for that, expect it. Don't take things personally. This is a difficult one for many because the day you become a, a leader or the day you become an owner, I should say, and you're working on becoming that level five leader, you don't want to get easily flustered or angered. It doesn't serve you well or it doesn't serve your business well. You want to reframe a bad day. And a bad day could be anything from anything that will take you off track. You know, it could be broken equipment, a team member that doesn't show up. Have a plan B so that you're prepared. And align your business, your team, whether it's suppliers, vendors, customers, your goals, Align everything that you do with your values. What has this done for me? What has this done for us, Tony and I, as shop owners? Well, we actually still enjoy going to work. <laughs> this year is going to be 20 years from us, and we still find it exciting. We're blessed to have a caring team. And resilience has allowed us to keep up with industry changes, our team goals, meaning each individual team members, what they want to achieve, and our customers' needs. And we're really excited and looking forward, you know, to the future. Now, were there bumps in the road? Of course there were. There were a lot of things that we had to develop. Hiring was one of them. You hear a lot of people talking about the challenges that we face in the industry. But I found that by developing those skill sets and persevering, right, not stopping, having that resilience, that when our skills got better, we were able to make better decisions and have that team that we're blessed to have. We wanted to build, um, purchase our building and the owner wasn't ready to sell. So we had to work around that and we had to keep pushing through. And then the day came when everything, what seemed like it fell into place, did, but with a lot of pre-work. And then I think one of the biggest things that we had to learn was we were thinking small. And what I mean by that is a lot of times what we're thinking of is our own needs 
and we really have to extend those needs out to the needs of the business, the needs of the team, the needs of our customers. And that's what I define as thinking small. So for me, you know, life I know is going to throw a lot of challenges at all of us. But with that mindset of resilience, you'll find a way to go through it and you'll become stronger in the process. And I tell people to really uh, trust that journey because to better the industry, I really believe that giving back and opening your mind, you know, your, your perspective to meet inspiring people, I find it really rewarding. And the, the best part of resilience is at the end of the day that you know that you made a difference. Wow. Thank you. Fabulous. Resilience. The, what I was thinking about when you were saying that is an episode we released today, 392. We had the top ATI 20 group, happens to be called the Leading Ladies. And it was Shelley Bennett, it was Kelly Weatherby, and it was Judy Hagelin. And it was a fabulous episode. We recorded it at Apex. And one of the big takeaways was humility. And I couldn't help but think some of the things you were saying in there about knowing self and and, and moving forward as a leader is that you have to know humility. Thank you so much for that, Marianne. Carm Capriato here with Ron Haugen of Westside Auto Pros. Ron... Are Jasper product improvements important when deciding to buy your next engine or transmission? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Not only important for me, because I know that I'm going to put a product in a vehicle that's going to last, but they're important for my customer. Uh, My customer's already got an engine that's failed, maybe because a component was under-engineered, and Jasper's gone in and found that and fixed that. And if somebody's committing to the kind of investment to put an engine in their vehicle, they're going to want the best one they can get. Hey, Ron, what could you tell me about Jasper's customer service? Jasper's customer service is above and beyond pretty much any of the vendor's customer service that we use. There's been times that I've often thought we we need to hire whoever trains Jasper's staff to come train my staff. I mean, from from the initial phone call to if there's a warranty problem, a question, a, a technical issue, Uh, They answer the phone, and you're immediately talking to the person that can help you. Hey, Ron, thanks for your insights on Jasper. Thanks for asking. I'm with Neil Bilodeau, Certified Repair Pail Shop from Safety Auto Centers in Wallingford, Connecticut. Hey, Neil. Hi, Carm. How are you? Are you using the Fair Price Estimator? We use the Fair Price Estimator when we have a phone quote. We tend to go to the fair price estimator tool to give some people a range. So we don't have to actually give them an exact number, but this is where the range is going to be. So you use it internally. We use it internally. Yes. There are people that use it externally. Uh, we get a, you know, we get some cold calls saying, Hey, I saw this online. It says it should be around here. Is that right? And most of the time, honestly, we're, we're in the range. That's great. Neil, how about the partner program? Partner programs working great. Um, they've partnered with CarMax and over the last few months, uh, roughly around six or seven months now. And it's, it's a fantastic program. CarMax is looking to outsource a lot of the repair and, um, we're doing a lot of it. So Neil, sum up repair pal. It's worth it. It really does work. Next up is Bob Greenwood. Learn to be a CEO. And boy, Bob, you really rustled up, you know, the industry talking about this a few years ago when you started to hammer that. Thanks, Carm. And it's a pleasure to be here with all these great people and happy 100th episode. Um, I'm a big believer that as a shop owner, a business owner, you really have to learn your role as an owner. And the CEO is a very top position that you're responsible for. And you really can't be a CEO uh, working in the business. You have to learn to work on the business and remove yourself and work at that 20 to 30,000 foot level. And let me summarize it this way. As a CEO, you have to learn how to use a telescope and how to use a microscope. Now, First, you have to have the telescope out there, meaning that you are looking at the industry, where it is going, where the consumer is going, where the future is going to be. And then you have to start looking at how am I going to do it? But you must do it based on facts. 
not emotion, not my gut feeling. For example, looking at some facts to make a decision. November 2018, VW to spend $50.2 billion on electric autonomous vehicles by 2023. $50.2 billion to develop them. October 2018, Honda invests in GM's autonomous unit, putting in $2.75 billion to develop the crews with them as an autonomous vehicle. June 2018, Volvo to make huge, big changes going to the consumer through electric cars and autonomous vehicles, getting very focused on that one-on-one relationship. June 2018, Fiat Chrysler unveils plan to make more electrified cars, moving to 2022, spending $10.5 billion. Tesla, autopilot is better than you, statistically. They have proven that in traffic safety, The consumer has one auto crash for every 492,000 miles driven. Whereas Tesla has proven accident-free crash-like events only occur every 1.92 million miles with the automated vehicle. They got a bad rap with that one in Phoenix. They are now going to say that wasn't right. So we are going to report on a quarterly basis our crash or accident prone and what we have with our automated vehicles. Car as a service is coming on board, CAAS, where people purchase the use of a vehicle as they need it, period, rather than own it. This is the real world coming up. Jupiter Research, Vehicle-to-vehicle communication to be installed in 62 million vehicles by 2023. That came out in December of 2018. These are the facts of where our industry is going. And I believe there are not enough owners are preparing their business, understanding that use of the telescope to gather the facts so they can adjust. Keep in mind, it really takes three to four years to move your culture of your business to another level. And dealing with all these things that are coming up, you can't wait till they're in your backyard. You've got to start addressing them now and planning for them. What is your marketplace? How are your commercial accounts going to be shaped up? Are you seeking out commercial accounts to look after their vehicles, knowing that the autonomous vehicle is going to be real, especially in commercial they're looking at? That's your telescope at work. Now you have to switch to your microscope. Your microscope is your business. Where are you sitting? Keep in mind as a CEO, your job is to start setting the right goals and objectives for your business with datelines to keep you accountable and your team accountable. Not we're gonna do this. We will have this done by June 20th, 2019. We will have this done by September 15th, 2019. Set datelines, but set the right goals. Once you set the goals, then you have to plan the business. How are we going to go about achieving those goals? What is my roadmap? What am I looking at? Is it going to achieve that goal in the timeline that I set, planning it this way? The third thing, under my microscope, I've got to hire remarkable people. Do I have the right people? Do they have the desire to achieve the goals that we want to go down. In other words, do they believe in the business and where it's going? Or do they just buy into it to keep a job? Two different avenues, two different points to take seriously. Also, as a CEO, you want to bring out the best in your people. A lot of us see talent within our own people that they really don't see themselves. Point it out to them, nurture them, encourage them, give them the opportunity to be the very best that they can be. And finally, as a CEO, it is your responsibility for the success of the business. Keep in mind, if you make the wrong decisions, the wrong move, and your business fails, you have affected every family 
that you have asked to join your company. This is a huge weight on your shoulders. It's a responsibility. And I encourage the industry to step up the game, become effective CEOs, chief executive officers of your company, and raise the bar and move it forward. Then we have a profession. The trade days are done. Welcome to the new aftermarket. You have got that thing coined. I love it. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, Bob. Your wisdom is is um, so valuable here on the uh, on the 100th week of the Town Hall Academy. Okay, great. I love where we're going with this. I'm I'm uh, inspired. I have goosebumps for how well this is going. And uh, let's uh, let's put a cherry on the Sunday with Greg Buckley talking about perseverance. Thanks, Carmen. And again, like everybody else, congratulations on the 100th show here. Uh, glad to be part of it and uh, the, such an astute uh, panel we have here. So um, my thing is perseverance and perseverance is something that you really do need. It's one of the, I guess, uh, intangibles that you got to have to become an effective leader because you're going to experience and need to have perseverance to get through the ups and downs of your business life. Um, and from there, you, you know, per- it goes back to conviction uh, looking at your convictions and what you sense is going to be your goal, uh, your goals, your team goals. Um, you have to have that in order to succeed, to have a successful business. You have to rely on your convictions and move forward. And perseverance, again, is one of those things that it helps get over the times when it's low and kind of, as, as Marianne said, humility uh, comes into play when things are too are, are very high. Uh, you have to be able to adjust accordingly. Um, there's times in every business person's career or life or even in the day that, you know, you fight what I call the genius idiot quotient. And that's how many days you feel like a genius divided by the days you feel like an idiot. And, you know, you come up with that. And, you know, you, sometimes the idiot side is much more higher. So, when you get to that point, you got to go, okay, I, there's an error. I got to correct it. What do I do? Um, you reach out to people who can help you. And that's another sign of a good leader, knowing where their limitations are. And then you bring in people where you are, they help you get to the next goal. Um, again, it, it, with, with, and, and I hate this. Everybody here's got so much great stuff to say. I'm I'm really feeling more like a student now. I'm listening to everybody come through, and and <laughs> I don't want to keep babbling, but there's always a wall that we're going to have to climb and a river to swim to get to our goals. Um, and it's not going to be easy. But we learn so much through that journey that we come out of it you know, looking back and going, wow, I did persevere through that. And look what it has gained me. I feel good about what I've done. My team feels good. When you feel good, I've always said that, you know, if you, if you don't have a good core, then nothing's really going to work, but having a great core for yourself, convictions, you know, your moral compass, all of that um, really starts to shine as you start to build and become successful. And that, and that just really, when you walk into a room, everybody knows what a leader is when they walk into the room. I mean, you can, it's just something that we all have and your, and your team will see that as well. If you're ineffective or you haven't taken care of the team, they'll certainly tell you in more ways than one. So I focus a lot on persevering. Um, it has been something that's part of me for ever and, and looking at the challenges and saying that, Hey, I will get through this. I, I, I have to be smarter than the day than yesterday in order to move forward. So that's where I focus on it. Um, I, I don't have much other than that to say that, listen, really sticking to it, learning your, knowing what your conviction is, looking at your horizons and making sure they're not just an oasis. You know, it's it, or a mirage, I should say, just a mirage, um, understanding everything and then realizing that, look, you're going to have to muster up some courage. You're going to have to move forward. You're going to have to persevere. You know, when you cross over that line to success, 
you look back and go, all right, that was pretty good. Tough, but pretty good. So. Hey, thanks a ton, Greg. I, l- listen, I love the genius idiot quotient. And, and, I, and, I, and the thing I love about that is it really helps ground ourselves that there isn't anything called perfection and that we're going to have really good days and we're going to have some really bad days. And if we persevere, we can find that middle ground. It's kind of like biorhythms, you know, you know, physically and mentally, you're not sometimes not always in sync. And you're wondering why you're having these up and down kind of days or feelings or emotions. And, and I thank well, from you from personal experience. So, I mean, the idiot side <laughs> comes out quite a bit. Trust so me. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> you get up every day, just like Marianne said, and man, we're going to, we're going to tackle this day. And, you know, an hour in, you say, oh, this is going to be one of those really bad ones. And, and you know what? It's all part of life. Accept it. It's not like you're doing everything wrong. It is those incoming challenges that you not necessarily were prepared for. But the better you get at being a leader, the better you can persevere through. Thank you so much for that. Up next, Shari Pheasant. Hey, Shari. Hey, Carm. Um, so very honored. Well, hang on one second. I didn't say Sherry's going to talk about willing to invest in your staff. Willing, willing to. I think just willing to is a good topic, right? Um, I'm so honored to see everybody here, Carmen. I think that you show Levels 5 leadership. That's why you're where you're at with this podcast. That's why all of us that invest um, in being a part of this training um, is working in our industry because it moves the pin. Um, I um, There's a lot of great businessmen to study, and Jim Collins is one of them. I think Level 5 leadership is um, a great definitive for us to work towards. But I think we need to know what it is, right? So um, I, w- I want to talk about Level 5 leadership, why training, what kind of training, how much, what's in it for me, because we all care about that, right? Why invest and how it saves you money. So um, I want... I want the people that are listening today to to go and get the book um, of Jim Collins and look up Level 5 Leadership because everything about Level 5 is people. At Level 1, you are just a good individual contributor. But the minute you get to Level 2, now you are contributing to group achievement. So you need to be a team leader. You need to be a team person. And so that goes into everything everyone said about vulnerable leadership listening and being a part of the team. But you also need to rise above to level five where you are like, you're building greatness in people. And that's what it's about. And you build greatness through training, right? So he taught the importance of putting people first before strategy. He outlined that level five leaders accept difficult realities that a business is in. And that's where we find businesses. Um, They might not admit it yet, but they are. And that they know that these organizations are going to rise above. He even uses the hedgehog principle. And the hedgehog principle is about identifying what economics work most effectively in your business, what a company is best at, and what truly moves your people. But that has to happen through a culture of discipline. And I love the word discipline. I think a lot. um, some people I meet, tend to look at it in a negative fashion. Um, I choose not to because when you have disciplined people, disciplined thought, and disciplined action, right, all three result in your business performance. So level five is leadership, is, is people-based. So why a training program? Well, um, it is proven, research-based. We can, you know, Google is amazing. The internet, we can find almost anything, whether it's right or not, is, is what we have to deal with, right? But training opportunities increase employee retention. So 25% of your people are leaving because of a lack of training. They don't say it's a lack of training, but it's a lack of training. Um, they don't know it's their job is too difficult. People are not getting along. They don't know what their roles are. They start bumping into each other. So training really defines a lot in your business. Um, it's cheaper than the cost of turnover. We know that turnover costs us five to 10 times, not just that employee salary, but potentially the people that are training them, the people that replace them, it puts us backwards. Um, We have to be training. You guys talked about it. The new technology that's in our industry is crazy. Um, And the how we're going to grow and change, we're going to have to invest in training. We look at it for technicians all the time. Sometimes we look at it for business. But I find that the training that is least embraced is people. But I believe that's the training that's the most relevant is people. Zig Ziglar said, you build people first and then the people build the business. And so we have to invest in them. I think the more your people know, the more they grow. So it's cheaper to retain than it is to bring new ones in. 
And skill development brings everybody up. It brings everybody together. It's about being involved in something bigger than yourself. So, um, and the gap now, it's, it's getting easier. So, well, I can't send them here. I can't do this. You know what? The classroom and to the, and it's the office is shrinking that gap. So it's easier to get ongoing training. We have great industry um, events. Um, there's hands-on mobile training apps. There's online training. There's in-person training. You've got coaches that'll visit you. You've got coaches that'll do it online. There's just no excuse for us not to be training. Um, so then there's the question, what kind of training, right? Um, and I think it is the blend. Um, it is three to 5% of your payroll. Um, that should be outlined for training. That is a best practice. Um, so if your payroll is just to play with numbers, I love numbers, they're the base of a business, 300K. It's kind of an average payroll um, that I find. Sometimes it's a little bit higher, sometimes lower. That means that you're spending nine to $15,000 a year on training. You should see that line item on your P&L. And I know that that's not happening. And it also happens to be a part of your 25% fixed expenses. So we need to make room for that. Um, when we train, I want to remind leaders that employees need to learn at their own pace. So they're not you. Uh, one of the things I really do with my clients is uncover their scientific self so they understand the difference between each other. Communication is 90% of the breakdown between teams. I call it the missed effect. You have miscommunication, misunderstandings, misdirected teams, missed opportunity. And um, I, I really like to focus on that with people. And so you, if your tra employees are trained, um, they represent your company better. I know we had employees, we had a moment when we started our shop, we didn't train and our employees made mistakes. We had less of cohesiveness of them working together and it really affected our business. It can take 10 to 25% off of your top line and more off your bottom line when employees aren't trained. So they, they learn to speak when they're trained, they learn to speak knowledgeably about your company passionately, and that connects with the client. And we know that we have to be a trusted advisor with clients now in order to charge what we need to charge to get the technicians that we need. We have to be trained. We need to have that presentation to our client that we know what we're doing because we do, but we need to really continue that. I'm, I'm a lifelong learner because um, I continue to be a vulnerable leader and make mistakes all the time. Um, they say you learn more from your mistakes, so I power through it, right? But I certainly um, am, am one of those that makes mistakes to learn. So um, I think that when you do this, your company is best represented. So I believe it's important to invest in training to change this industry because it's what we're based on. We're based on training. We're based on factualities. We're based on learning. And so we just need to widen our scope of what we need to learn, and we need to know that people are most important. So. I believe that when you invest in training, you attract great employees, you keep great employees, it builds loyalty, it builds your reputation, it helps you create, make, create promotable employees so you can get out of the shop. Um, it keeps your employees engaged at work, it, it helps you save and earn money, and it forces you to look into the future because training requires forward thinking. We talked about, you guys talked about it earlier, proactive versus reactive. It's really important. And so um, I think the biggest push I find is how does training save me money? And so my answer to that is untrained employees are unhappy employees. And employee happiness is the greatest profit driver in your business. Untrained employees have lower production value. Untrained employees are inefficient. They lose time and money due to mistakes. It increases your miscellaneous expenses and your insufficient, trust, your insufficient staff training loses customers all day long. I know that to level up, to level five leadership, you've got to put people first. You have to invest in them. And that starts with you. So invest in training for yourself to be a better leader. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. A couple of my takeaways was discipline for me is not a bad word. I think it's a very strong word. I think we need to embrace that word. By the way, she mentions Jim Collins. The book is good to great. It's also on my books page on the website. And she said, listen, put a line item on your P&L called called training and you know i i although yes it's an expense i think it needs to be on the balance sheet if everyone can appreciate an investment that it would be an investment yes, yes. chris clodier is up next delegate and get out of the way right chris 
Absolutely. And and first, Carmen, let me tell you, I'm impressed that you have everybody sitting here patiently waiting for their turn, right? Everybody wants to jump in on all these topics. I know it. We all are like, hey, oh, I got something to add to that. Yeah, you're right. So mine, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I'm impressed. It's, it's very good. Mine is delegate and get out of the way. So over and over again, I've been blessed and I, I've been lucky to go into many shops. And I see the scenario play out over and over again where I'm sitting there talking to the owner, technician walks in. And says, hey, you know, I got a problem with this part. See the service rider walk in and say, hey, I'm building this ticket and I need help with this pricing or I need help with the customer. And, and I sit there and I go, wow, like, what are you doing? Are, are you running your business or is your business running you? How are you delegating to your people and, and allowing them to do their job? And I, I, I personally, luckily, I chase butterflies. I'm not like Greg Buckley. So I have now two auto repair shops and I have a software company, so I can't be at one place at one time. So I'm kind of lucky. I force myself out of the position. I have to have people delegate. If not, I would literally lose my mind. I think as shop owners and, and as CEOs like Bob referred, th there's multiple reasons why we don't delegate. And, and I got a couple lists here. One is I know we're doers. I, we're very type A, let's get stuff done. We check it off our list and it feels good. And we can't rely on other people to check things off our list because they don't do it fast enough. They don't do it smart enough. They don't do it well enough. They don't do it like us. And that's hard when you're trying to delegate and you're trying to coach other people and you're trying to train other people. We reflect on them to be us. And we're like, why can't you do it as good as we can do it? So get it out of the way. Let me do it. And, th and that is one of our big reasons. I think another reason is we don't want to fail. Uh, to, to Bob's point, as a CEO, I don't want to run my companies into the ground. So if I trust something very important to somebody, then I'm very fearful that they may or may not pull through on that thing. So I have to be careful. So I think, once again, this is reason for why we don't delegate. We should look past that fear and say, hey, unless they're burning down our shop, we should delegate it. We absolutely should, in, unless they're going to ruin our business. And, and we know if we set proper boundaries and goals, and like you said, look, with that microscope or that telescope to make sure that things are running fine, we have indicators. Another reason is, I think this is probably the most important reason, we're heroes in our business. We start our business, we are the key people. And once you start working on your business and not in your business, the customer doesn't tell you that you're great anymore, nor does the technician go, man, fantastic day, you ran the counter like, like, a, like a boss, right? You're sitting in your office and they're going, God, what are they doing all day? Like, it, does Chris work anymore? You know, he's not around. I don't see him here. You know, what importance is, because everybody else is in here providing value, and we like to feel like we're providing value. We like to feel like we're the firefighter. When there's a problem, oh, I, I solved eight problems today, and I feel good about it. I feel good about that ticket that wasn't written up properly. I feel good about that technician could figure out that problem, so I figured it out. And I think that's one of the most important. That validation of us as individual contributors, level ones, right, is, is one of those main things that I think bring us out and, and not allow us to delegate. And then I think another thing we've talked about, just leadership in general, I'm sure we've all done this. There are a lot of shop owners that if you ask them if they're a leader, they'll tell you no. They don't see themselves as leaders, and, and but which is true. Just because you buy a shop doesn't mean you're a leader. It means you're an owner. But if you realize as a owner that you're not a good leader, then you should go find somebody to lead your business for you, or you should train yourself to become a good leader, right? And I have a couple solutions for those people out there that struggle. Replace yourself. Your goal should be to replace yourself. You don't want to have that job. Find somebody who's going to do that job better. I, I played in a rock and roll band. I always had bands want me to manage them, and I'm like, not going to manage you because I'm, I'm a star. I'm a singer. I'm a guitar player. I should have managed bands. I'm much better at managing companies than I was at running companies, right? And I, it took me a long time to realize that. When I first bought the first shop, I want to be on the counter. I want to be star sales guy. I want to be number one. And I realized I'm not going to be able to expand. I'm not going to be able to do anything if I become head sales guy. My guys at the counters now can blow the doors off of anything I could do. And I'm okay with that, right? I have to be okay with that. I have to appreciate who they are. Once again, let them do their jobs. So replace yourself. Set a goal to get out of your shop, right? Whether it's turn off your phone, whether it's, hey, I've got to go to my home office and I've got to work there for a day. 
and you can't get a hold of me. Don't respond to those text messages as, as quickly as you do. Let, let them, give them 30 minutes, give them 45 minutes, give them an hour. And guess what? They're going to send you a text that says, oh, I figured it out. Don't worry about it. Because I see it too many times that we'll give somebody a job and then immediately we'll jump back in and we'll say, after you know, a couple of weeks, and I was talking to another business owner, he's like, yeah, I'm trying to get this one guy to manage these three other guys. And I said, great. How many times have you jumped in in the last couple of weeks? And he, well, he comes to me every you know other day and asks me, I said, and you keep giving him the answer. So he's going to keep coming to you. He, he's never going to do his job if you just don't give him the job and then go away, get out of the way. And like Bob said, work on your business and not in your business. You're, you're doing something important. You are the chess you, you're not the piece on the chessboard. You're the guy moving the chess pieces, which is the most important player in a chess game, if you think about it. So delegate, get out of the way, and replace yourself. Thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> who chases butterflies here? <laughs> yeah, no, right, Greg. I not know Gre- you're done. Not Greg anymore. <laughs> Actually, you know, it's that time of the year, you know, when there's a lot of Christmas cards that have glitter on it. God help it. Every time I see a piece of glitter, I'm looking, you know, God, not, not. Uh, and, and sometimes it's really hard to get out of your way. And, and I love what you said, Chris. And my thought was, tell your people that you're the CEO and that you cannot be the chief cook and bottle washer. And there, there's this day that when you feel you've arrived and you've done the kind of training and delegating that you can't draw yourself back in. And again, it goes back to the word discipline. You have to have, and discipline's a good thing when it comes to making sure you you, you, you um, perform your new role. Thank you so much for that. Well, you know, Brian, I don't think I introduced you in the beginning. No, I think you missed me. I think I missed you because I'm, I'm sitting here saying, I never talked about Brian. Brian Walker is the founder and CEO of Five Stones Media, a marketing agency in Hammond, Louisiana, and a former shop owner, and he's specializing, uh, I believe, in automotive repair shops. Brian is going to talk about a subject called Be Your Word. Yes, so when I talk about this, I'm really preaching to myself because it has, uh, it has made such a, a big impact on me, something that I didn't even realize that I was doing. You know, so I consider myself to be a man of integrity. Uh, first time that my coach told me to stop lying, it really bothered me. Uh, I soon realized that he was talking about lying on a deeper level than I'd ever thought about. So when I thought about lying, I always equated it with uh, intentionally telling an untruth for the purpose of manipulation. And that's not what I'm talking about here. You know, so when I say be, be your word, if I'm a little more harsh about it, what I mean is stop lying. So you know, what I'm talking about are the lies that you tell without even realizing that you're doing it. And these lies come in a couple of forms, uh, the lies that you tell others and the lies that you tell yourself. And the lies that you tell others, they may look like this. We're going to get a new alignment machine soon. And you keep saying that for three years. Well, nobody believes you. You haven't been saying that for three years because you've been trying to be manipulative. You, you probably even believe it when you said it. But the fact of the matter is you just have no concept of the power of words. Nobody believes that you're going to get a new alignment machine. What's worse is they don't believe the other things that you say either because you're not a person of your word. You were a liar. Uh, Or you tell the team that you're going to hold them accountable to doing multi-point inspections on every car that comes into the shop. And you start out strong. Uh, At the end of each day, you're looking through every repair order and making sure the inspection reports and the estimates are attached. Uh, And after a week or so, you fall off just like every other time before. You You weren't a person of your word. You were a liar and your team knows that, but you know who else knows it? Your spouse, your kids, because your spouse knows that Thursday night is supposed to be date night. They also know how many times you've bailed on it because you had some, you know, you had to stay at the shop late to catch up on paperwork. Uh, Your kids hear you say that you're going to be at their game, but they don't really expect you to be at their game because you've had things come up so many times before. And in your mind, it's all justified because you're the provider and, and you are, but you've also been a liar. So, you know, let's look at the other way that you lie. And that's when you lie to yourself. And this can be the most dangerous of lies. And this is what my coach really called me out on. So we've all got these stories that we carry around. Um, and we use them as crutches. We use them as excuses. Sometimes we even brag about them. And some of my stories are, you know, 
I'll always be overweight, my genetics. Or I'm too much of an introvert to be a good salesman. Or maybe, you know, I'm fully capable of building a good business, but I don't have what it takes to build a great business. And these are all stories or well, they're, they're lies that I've told to myself. And these are the things that my coach opened my eyes to. And when I realized what was happening, I started to shift and have become a much more powerful person. I have relentlessly become dedicated to being a man of my word. And when someone is a person of their word, the people around them know it. You know, when you become a person who every time you say that you're going to do something, you do it, people look at you with an entirely different view. If you want to be a level five leader, become a person of your word. Simply, you know, be your word. You know, if you want that new alignment machine, but you're not sure how you can make it happen, don't say you're going to get a new alignment machine. But what you can do is call your team together and make a plan for how to make it happen and then see it through relentlessly. If you tell your team you're going to start holding them accountable to doing multi-point inspections, well, you better hold them accountable you know, and, and let nothing get in your way. You know, if Thursday night's a date night, make it sacred. You know, no matter what, you make sure it happens and you be fully present. Or present you know, and and if, you, if you tell your kids you're going to be at their game, you be there, period. And stop negotiating your commitments. It's just another way of lying. You know, if you set your alarm for 4.30 a.m. with the intentions of getting up and going to the gym, when the alarm goes off, get up and go. Because, no, you're not going to go after work. You know, you need to go when you originally said you were. My coach, he has me practice something that he calls conscious self-creation. Um, Tony Robbins calls it incantations. Most people would call it affirmations. And it's become one of the most powerful parts of my day. I've got these five statements that I write down and I read them silently, then I read them aloud. Uh, and one of those statements is, I'm a man of my word, and I do what I say I will do. And you have no idea how often I repeat that to myself when I'm faced with something that I said I would do, and then I try to, to negotiate my commitment. It, it seems so simple, but it changes everything. I'm convinced that there's really nothing that you can do that's more powerful than this, to be your word every single time. And yes, things are going to come up that are beyond your control. And when they do, you have to ask yourself, is there anything that I can do that will allow me to keep my commitment? And if there's not, well, you do what you have to do. And you let the other people know as far in advance as you can and apologize to them and make sure that they understand what's going on. But if there is something that you can do, then you do what you have to do and be your word. And one final thought, you know, when you decide to go down this road of being your word, don't tell people, just do it, you know. Show them through your actions, because if, you've, if you have historically been a person who is not your word, it'll take a while to overcome it, but you will. Wow. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm, uh, I was immersed in that. Thank you, Brian. Really good stuff. I wrote down commitment, trust, integrity, um, you know, and wow, very good, powerful stuff. Um, Bill Hill is with us. And, you know, Bill, it's great to have you on the Town Hall Academy. Uh, we met Thank you. We met maybe three years ago. You came on in the early days, you know, in that first 100 episodes. And uh, I've so admired your business. Uh, Bill's going to talk about high expectations of your staff building a powerhouse team. Go ahead, Bill. Well, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm kind of humbled here by being among some of my peers here. I'm not quite sure I belong in this panel, but I'll do my best to hold up my end of it. Um, what, I, what, I, what I do when I, what I like to do when I'm hiring people is, is find the, the weakness in the people that um, I've had before them, and I like to build on that. So I like to, I like to hire people that I can make overachievers. Um, I, I believe that by you can mold those people into becoming better at what they are. No one comes in as a perfect fit. You have to be patient. You have to allow them to make mistakes. And one of the things I like that Chris and Sherry both said was people are the most important part of your business. Give them the, the empower them to delegate, what, or empower them to do what they need to do, delegate what you need to do, do some training. And what I like best about finding overachievers is they love all of that stuff. They love having the power. They love going through the training. I don't have to push them to uh, go to school at night or go to school during the day or to do webinars. Um, it's important that we find the people that we need and bring them into our business. My particular business, um, my vision for my business is I want to be known as the best customer service in my area. And I am. 
I'm known as the best customer service. I hired the right people to do that. When you, when you look for people to bring into your business, I want people to do everything better than what I can do it. As Chris said, I don't want to be there. Um, and I hire people that are better at what they do. I was, I thought I was a superstar salesman. <laughs> I sucked. <laughs> you know, quite frankly, I wasn't very good at it. I have a superstar salesman who's a who's who's really good at what he does. Um, my particular business model, I don't believe in in hard sales. I believe in educating the client, telling them what's wrong and 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 making the sale that way. Um, and and that's what my salesman does. And and I'm I when I'm proud of him for what he's achieved in such a short period of time. And again, he came in as from a as a technician, I turned him into a salesman, and now um, Frankly, he sells $1.2 million a year uh, he, and he does a great job. Customers love him. In most cases, when a customer walks in the door, they don't even know who I am. My customer service rep, she's an overachiever. She loves people. Uh, she builds relationship. She's involved with the community. We're involved with the community. And I think it's important for us to, to make sure that we, when we're looking to bring in new, new, new employees, that we do the things that are important to our community, to our other business, other businesses in the area and to our other employees. And when it comes to training, I have four overachievers and those four people keep the rest of my staff interested in training. They, if, if one guy says he doesn't want to go because he has something to do, there's always that other technician saying, what could be more important than going to training with us? So Everything that has been said in this panel is, is exactly how I feel about my business. Um, and, and, it's, it's working for me, um, and, and I enjoy being around my employees. They enjoy coming to work. I've had employees come to me and say, I've been offered a better position for more money, but I'm staying because I love the culture in this place, and we have a lot of fun. And I think the day that a, a customer or an employee has to walk in the door and they feel like they're not comfortable and they're not happy and they don't want to come to work, then there's a culture problem there. And, and you need to fig, figure out what you're doing wrong and how to make that customer employee want to come to your business and work there. Um, I think you get better production, you get more satisfied people, more satisfied clients. Um, and this is something great about, I was, I missed my, I actually missed my employees. I was, I didn't see them for four days. I couldn't wait to see them on Wednesday morning to talk about Christmas. And, and we virtually in our team meeting, we have every morning, which usually is about three minutes. It was 45 minutes long because we kept talking about all the things that we did during Christmas, all the gifts, what the kids did, that kind of stuff. And I think that's important. Wow. Wow. That was a that was a heartwarming uh, a piece of uh, information, Bill. Thank you so much. High expectations of being an overachiever. Uh, you're not uh, immune to that. I mean, literally, as the leader, if you're expecting that from your people, you need to be. Um, talk about having fun at his place. I really encourage everyone, go to the website, type in Bill Hill, find his original episode, and and listen to it, because you're going to hear about Nancy Sinatra Day uh, at the shop. And, of course, if anyone is familiar with Leanne Best from Breaks for Breasts, that's Bill's significant other and um, great person. And uh, thank you so much. Great, great advice. I sure appreciate it. And I'm sure you all want to chime in here in a minute. In fact, I think we'll do an open mic here at the end. Brent Bowman, as contributor to Up Your Game, Become a Level 5 Leader, is going to talk about training within. Well, first of all, I don't know about everybody on the panel here, but my head is about ready to explode with all this good conversation. I mean, it's, this is just awesome. I mean, I just might ramble here about a whole bunch of things, but anyways, uh, train within is my topic. And this morning I told my wife, I said, I kind of want to change the words on that. Train is good, but what about train and develop within? You see, we're all business owners and we're all leaders and we're also responsible for something really great in business and that is we're responsible for these human lives that we we touch within our business and what i mean is we could also be responsible for a lot of potential human waste big time so that's where i get into development training training like i said it is good it's great but if we can't give the people within our business significance and purpose it's just not enough. It's not enough. It's, it's not going to, it's not, we need to identify the stepping stones to our goals and help our people reach those goals. Now, don't get me wrong. 
it's not for everybody. We also have to have good core values. We have to hire the right people that match those values and also uh, live them out, right? We need to live them out. I heard someone say before, um, leaders, they not only say what, I mean, they do what they say. And, and that is very true. We also need to be sure that we're also doing what we say. Um, also, I heard this acronym, it was, so it was, it, was, uh, it was a good business acronym. It was called RATE. It stands for relationship plus attitude times expectation, or excuse me, times talent plus expectation equals production. All those things need to happen for a, success, a successful business. So training within, the reason why I want to talk about today is because I don't believe in a technician shortage. I, I just don't buy it. Their schools are still being filled. I mean, there's still kids in the class in the classrooms, right? They're in the seats. I think the biggest shortage is uh, leadership. That's where I think we're where we're failing, is because these kids, some of them, for one thing, they're they're so scared to even come to a job interview to be a technician. I mean, they they won't even try. We need to get in the classrooms and get involved right away and show them that we want you and we don't want you to just work on cars, but we want you as a whole person. We want to develop you. We want to invest in you. We want to train you and show them that they're worth it. Give them that significance. So we need to, we need to be doing more. Um, but anyways, I've seen and heard so many stories that the shops say, well, you just can't find good help. You just can't find good help. Well, they get help in there. They get them in the seats. And you know what? Then they ruin them. They ruin them right away. And then they go off to another industry. We can't let that happen. we got to show that we believe in them. Training within, is it going to be tough? Absolutely. Is it an opportunity to show us who we really are and what we're made of, a, You know, who we are as ourselves? Absolutely. Times get tough. That's when things get really good because that's when we develop. And what I want to point to is training and developing. I truly believe training has points where you start and end. Developing is, it never ends. It's continual. It's growth. And I think if you get the right people with the right core values in there, they'll be just as hungry for it as, as, as we are, right? And that's what we want. I think the worst thing that any of us could ever have is get get the right person in there and not develop them and keep them. I would rather have every one of my people be developed and lose them and see them go on to greater things. I want to be in the people biz building business. And I think that's what we really need to do because we are in the people business. We say it all the time in sales with our customers, but what about everybody else? So I guess what I want to point out is, is training inside your organization, technical sales, whatever is great. It needs to be done. It needs to be, it needs to happen, but put people first, develop people. Remember success is not, it's not going to be measured in dollars. Success is going to be what you become. That's where we truly measure. Thank you, Brent. You know, I always say this, it seems at the end of every town hall academy, I can't believe where it went, you know, because the contributions were so incredible week after week after week. I can't wait to start 101 episode next week. My, my my big takeaway was we're in the people business. I mean, that was that's a, that's a powerful thing. And you mentioned core values and bill talked a lot about culture we have done so many shows on culture and it, it not necessarily focused on culture but so many professionals have come on the show and said hey we have a great culture here's how we did it we believe in culture we built it we didn't have it to start with please go to my website find the tag cloud where all those words are shaped click on business culture and listen to a few of those because i think they may motivate you to uh to, to be in the people business. And, and in fact, I don't think you can be in the real people business and do career pathing if you didn't have the right mission, vision, values, purpose, and culture. 
And, and you know, that, again, I, I don't think there is a simple answer to what we talked about here uh, on uh, upping yourself to become a level five leader. But boy, do we have a great start for you all. Does anyone want to say anything, any quick summary? Since we're over time anyway, who cares? You, you talked about, uh, you know, our young. We're an industry that eats our young. We don't nurture our young. We need to develop them. Right? We, you know, we need as leaders to develop our young. And then we won't have the talent shortage that we say we have. That's a great point. You know, uh, Nastaf, Donnie, um, Cypher, uh, Chris Chesney, Carquest, they're all working um, diligently on career pathing for the entire industry. And I, and I think that's going to, if that discipline, good word, gets into play, I think we'll have a much better uh, means uh, to an end to keep our people. I got two things I would like to say if I could real quick. So I was listening to Zig Ziglar in the morning. I always love to listen to him. He said, when he made this uh, speech about see you at the top, he says, we need to delay our, our gratification and shift from our rights to our responsibilities. Also, he gives a story, and this is, I think, the most powerful, because he talks about two people. One person said he was an alcoholic, and he said, I had no choice. My father was an alcoholic, so I'm an alcoholic. He goes to the next person. This person was a successful businessman, made lots of money, and just overall success in life. He said, I had no choice. My father was an alcoholic. If you're not a leader today, you have a choice to be a leader tomorrow. It's that simple. That's what I want to leave out with that. Thank you, Brett. Hey, thank you to everyone. Enjoy your weekend. I, I am honored to have all of you here on the 100th Town Hall Academy. Vic Tarasic, Marianne Croce, Bob Greenwood, Shari Pheasant, Chris Clodier, Bill Hill, Brian Walker, and Brent Bowman. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.